Hi online family, Maddie here. We're here at church getting ready for Sunday and I'm so excited that you're a part of this message. We're a church that loves God, loves people and loves life. And I'm praying that this message is gonna speak to you, it's gonna inspire you and uplift you in your journey in life. So why don't you go ahead and share it with someone in your world and let's be all a part of what God is doing together. Hey, real quick, uh, I just wanna introduce you to my family. Um, if you could throw out the picture, this is, this is my family. Um, I, I'm a little older than Pastor Matt, so um, I just turned 50. I'll be turning 54, and so I'm excited about that. But my kids are 25. That's my son on the right side, Colby. He's married to Madison, beautiful family. Um, been married for three years. They got married very young because I, I want them out of the house. <laughs> and they're not, never allowed to come back, ever. Um, and, then, and then that's my daughter and her husband, Noah and Cabell. So they're all C's, Colby, Cabell, Cassidy. And she's 23. They were actually born on the same day, two years apart. And then my youngest is sitting on the floor there. She's not married yet, but I like the guy that she's dating right now. He's a really nice guy, has a good job, and um, <laughs> makes a lot of money. Because I mean, she's going to eat. That's one of the things you got to make sure of. Girls, if you're fine, looking for a husband... First thing you should check out, W-2s. <laughs> Just saying. And then that's my wife in the middle. Been married for 30 years. 30 years. All in a row. Same woman. You have to make sure you say that these days, even in church. And so I love my family. So we celebrated 20 years as a, as a church, and then 30 years. Wed, I took my wife to Greece. It was phenomenal. Beautiful place. And so... I'm just so thankful. What an honor to be here. Um, I love your church. I love what's going on here. What an amazing time. Uh, in 2006, uh, I, I kind of hit a wall as a pastor. I, I grew up um, a good pagan, so I didn't get saved until later on in life. My mom was a uh, drug dealer, and my dad was an alcoholic. So I kind of grew up in that, in that world, and then I got radically saved, t totally delivered from alcohol, totally delivered from drugs, I mean, one day doing them, the next day not, and fell madly in love with the Bible. And then, you know, Jesus is the Word, and so kind of all, I just love the Bible. I started reading the Bible, and I just fell in love with the Word. And so I, I got called to pastor this church in Charlotte, and so we started this church. It was growing. We were getting ready to purchase about 30 acres of land, and we didn't have any money. We had to raise $200,000. I was traveling a lot ministry, and I, and I came to this point where I think we can get sometimes, where we wrestle with the hero that we want to be, but the human that we really are. And I was sitting on the front row in a service about this time of the year, and I had a massive panic attack right in the middle of the service. And this began a journey of trying to figure out this whole idea of what mental illness, anxiety, depression, panic, because I suffered for about... 15 years. This is my 16th year of having to navigate this. I can tell you that I, I am, uh, I haven't had a panic attack in seven years, and um, I'm a full believer of counseling and drugs. Amen. And so, um, good drugs, like the prescription kind, not the, so I know what you're thinking about, but that's not what I was talking about. And so, um, and so I, I, I really feel like God has uh, graced our ministry to help people through this. Because in a room like this, about 40% of you deal with anxiety or depression or panic. Um, and there's pre probably people watching right now that didn't come today because of anxiety. I met a few people in between the services and their kids were not here because of anxiety and different things like that. I'm so proud of a church that would actually address this. And hopefully today will help you. I wrote this book um, a few years back Really simply to share with you that if I can do it, you can do it. This, you read this and you go, oh my gosh, this guy is jacked up and he still can pastor a church, honestly. And so you'll go, oh, there's nothing wrong with me. I mean, this guy was really messed up. So make sure you get the book afterwards. And I want to talk about one specific aspect that causes anxiety, depression. There's lots of different things that, that can cause you to go down that route. Um, physiological issues, you don't get enough rest, your body things that you eat, um, which I've done all the study on all of this. There, there are relational issues. Some of us are in relationships that we need to end um, because they're causing us a lot of anxiety. You know, there's, there's nothing more great than deleting somebody out of your contact list. 
and then never answering their phone call again. Amen. Some of y'all just got free right there. There are environmental issues. Sometimes we're in environments that are just unhealthy that we need to get out of and stay out of. There are biological issues. And then, of course, there are spiritual issues, which is what I want to talk about today. And one specific issue that can cause you to go down this road is fear. So if you want to title this, you can call this, How Do I Conquer Fear? How Do I Annihilate Fear? Now, I'm a Bible teacher, and so if you could pull something out, take some notes, write some stuff down, it does two things. You remember it, and it makes me feel real good about this message, like you're you're actually learning something. So write some stuff down, write on your neighbor, whatever you need to do to get it going. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just unpack this one verse, 2 Timothy chapter 1, because when I say fear, you immediately think of one verse, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's kind of the fear verse. That's the Bible fear verse. And we're going to talk about that verse. However, I think it's good to get some context around the verse so you know why you're quoting what you're quoting. And so Paul wrote, wrote two books or two letters to this guy named Timothy. Timothy was Paul's fixer. He would send Timothy as a young minister into situations to help him. Paul would plant these churches, leave leadership, and then later on he would send Timothy if there was a problem in the church. Now this particular letter was written while he was in Corinth. And he was struggling because Corinth was just getting out of control spiritually. They were having all kinds of crazy stuff and weird sin happening. And and I believe Timothy was going through a bout of anxiety or depression or something because, you know, Paul wrote these two letters, and the first letter is a letter of instruction. The second letter is a letter of inspiration. So he's inspiring Timothy to come out of something. So look at verse 3. You can look at the screen behind me or cheat off a Christian beside you, all right? Verse three, 2 Timothy chapter one. I thank God, everybody say, I thank God, I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, is without ceasing. I remember you in my prayers day and night. Paul knew how to pray, man. He was a prayer. I love it when I meet somebody who knows how to pray. My pastor, Pastor Gerald, knows how to pray. He makes me nervous when he prays. You know, he's like, it's like one of those moments where the, the clouds kind of open up and the light comes down and you think Jesus is coming back at that moment. You know, you start repenting of stuff you didn't even do. That's what I do when Pastor Gerald starts to pray. I mean, he can pray. When, you, when he prays, man, God moves. I love it when people pray. Paul's saying, I'm praying for you, Timothy. Greatly desiring, verse four, to see you, be mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy. Now, why would he say that? I understand your tears, but I'm going to be filled with joy. Because Paul understood that this was only going to last for a certain time for Timothy. That there was, this circumstance was going to be over. And I know you're going through it right now, but I'm telling you, it's going to turn out for the good. Verse 5. Then he says, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith. Everybody say faith. Say it real loud. Say faith. I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. I am persuaded is in you also. I love this. What Paul is telling Timothy is, I understand what you're going through, but you have enough faith to overcome it. And this is what I know about you, Colonial Church. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what family problem, I don't know what money problem, I don't know what marriage problem, kid problem, whatever, physical problem, but I do know that you have enough faith to overcome it. You really do, because you wouldn't be going through it if God didn't believe you have enough in you to get over it. So, so he ha- there, it's in there, and so he tells Timothy, hey, listen, I know it's in there because you have a legacy of faith. I know your grandma, and your grandma's got some faith. There's nothing better than grandma faith, (laughs) Mimi faith, Nana faith, whatever you call your grandma. My grandma knew how to pray, Mimi. She's in heaven now. She's sitting in the cloud of witnesses, which I think is just, you know, these bleachers with different zones in the Troy Maxwell zone. She's on the front row. She told me one, you know, later on in life, she said she would come to church every week. She said, you're my second favorite preacher. I'm like, come on. I said, who's your first? And she said, Joel Osteen. <laughs> I think it was the mullet that he had. So I was never going to crow a mullet out. 
And so, so my grandma, whenever I would take a girl home, like in my teenage years, and she had the big old Bible sitting beside her desk, like the huge Bible, and I would bring a girl home, and I'd think, man, this girl's cute, you know, and, and she, my grandma's going to like her. And if she gave her the wrong look, two weeks, gone. Because grandma can pray a girl out of her grandson's <laughs> life in a second. She, they know, man. They got that grandma anointing on them. That's what Paul's telling Timothy. I know your grandma. I know your grandma has faith. And if you don't believe that, I know your mama. See, there's grandma faith, and then there's mama faith. Mama bears, no, they have some faith. They can change things. You know why? Because they're going. If, you're, if your mom is here, she went into your room at night, laid on your bed, prayed in tongues for hours while you were at the club, <laughs> and put scriptures under your pillow, and, and you'd find a little piece of paper, and you'd like, what is that? Mom put it there. <laughs> Anointed with oil. She'd put it on the doorpost when you walk through. I mean, that's mama faith. Mamas can change mountains. They can move stuff. Mama faith. So here's what Paul's, what's Paul's telling us. Timothy, I know your grandma. She's got faith. I know your mom. She has faith. I know you have faith. Now, if you didn't, have a, if you didn't grow up in a Christian family, well, you have a legacy, a spiritual legacy of faith. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joshua, Daniel, Isaiah. That's your legacy of faith. Maybe you're a first-generation Christian. Guess what? You have a legacy of faith you can draw from. Come on, everybody shout faith, faith, faith. Therefore, verse 6, therefore, whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, you check what it's there for. This is a transition statement. He's building upon something. I remind you, I love this. I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. What Paul was saying is, hey, Timothy, you remember that time in that service where we were singing that song, and I came and I laid my hands on you. There was a deposit in you to handle any situation that you're going through. Lean on that moment. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Verse eight, therefore, what do you do with a therefore? You check what it's, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, which tells me that, that Timothy was having a bit of an issue with standing up for the gospel because of the pressure of what was going on in, our, in the culture. Kind of sounds familiar. Nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. For God has not given us a spirit, a spirit of fear. You know, do not fear shows up 103 times in the Bible. Over and over, God says, do not fear, do not fear, do not be afraid. He told Abraham, I'm gonna send you into another country, a place you've never been to. You gotta leave your family, you gotta leave your father, you gotta leave your stuff, but do not fear. He told the Israelites, hey, listen, you're gonna wander in the desert, but I'm gonna send you your promised land, do not fear. He told Moses, do not fear. He told David, do not fear. He told Daniel, do not fear. He told Jacob, do not fear. He told Joshua, do not fear. And you know what he's saying to you? Do not fear, do not fear. Look at your neighbor, point at him, say, do not fear. Fear, do not fear. See, the problem, why we deal with fear is because people are feeding their fears instead of feeding their faith. So here's the question you gotta answer for yourself. How much time are you spending researching your fears instead of researching your faith? Are you Googling all the pains that you feel or are you trusting in Isaiah 53 that says, by his stripes I am healed? That's faith, faith. We gotta overcome fear, overcome fear. Fear, Psalms 34, verse four, I sought the Lord. Here's what David said. I sought the Lord, he heard me, and he delivered me from all my fears. I love that. So let's break this passage down. Let's, let's break this whole idea down. 2 Timothy 1, 7. Can we throw it up on the screens? Because I want us to read it all together. Can we read this all together? All right, so ready? One, two, three, let's read it. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That was fantastic. Let's do it one more time. One more time, Ready? One, two, three. For God. That was really good. So let's break this down. There's four parts to this verse. The first is Paul tells Timothy, God tells us that God, he has not given us a spirit of fear. Understanding that fear is a spirit. It's not an emotion. It invokes emotion, but it's not an emotion. Fear, listen to me, fear is a spirit that wants to take the place of God in your life. 
It wants to pull every bit of faith. It wants to drain you of your faith. Pull it all out of you. To walk in the spirit of fear. Fear wants to remove our dependence on God and in exchange for a dependence on self. Now, we know this because of the first time fear is introduced. Okay, this is, this is interesting because when you're looking at the Bible, when you study the scriptures, the best way to learn something about a specific topic, a person, an issue, is to look at the first time it was ever mentioned in the Bible. It's called the law of first mention. And so the first time fear ever shows up is in Genesis chapter 3. And we know the story, Adam and Eve, God, God created them, created this incredible place, uh, put them in the Garden of Eden, you know, it was like 72 degrees, no humidity, they're naked, come on, it's like having no kids in your house, it's awesome, that's, I mean, I'm, I don't have any kids in my house anymore, that's all I do, we just run around naked all the time, it's awesome, and so, so, Satan shows up, the serpent shows up, and he asks Eve and Adam a question. Because God had put him in this perfect place and said, hey, you can enjoy all of these trees except one tree you're not to eat of. Now, I have a lot of young people ask me the question, why would God put a tree in a garden and tell them not to eat from it? And this is important because love doesn't exist without choice. So we all have to be presented with choice. You've been given a free will. It's your decision whether you love God or not. Or else God would force it on us and we'd just be robots. And so he puts this tree and says, I need you to obey me. Because Jesus told us later, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. He didn't say, if you obey my commandments, you'll love me. He said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. So God says, hey, if you love me, don't eat of this tree. So the, this, the serpent shows up, Satan shows up, and, and the first things he says to man is, did God really say? Because that's what fear does. Fear will question the word of God. Always question the word of God. Because the word of God is where faith is built. So if he can get you to pull away from, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If he can get you away from the word of God, he can introduce fear and get you to question, well, well did God really say that? Did, did God really say that I could be healed? Did God really say that I could have a good marriage? Did God really say that I, I would be prosperous? Did God really say that? And so he's introducing fear to man at this moment. And they eat, you know what happens, they sin, they disobey God. And then God shows up for their regularly scheduled small group. And he says, he, he says, hey, Adam, where are you? Now listen, God never asks a question because he doesn't know the answer. See, Adam didn't know where he was. And so Adam is hiding behind this bush, and he says, remember what he said? I heard your voice, and I was afraid. First time fear is introduced. Now, what was he trying to convince Adam and Eve to do? He said, if you eat of this, you'll be like God. Okay, time out. They were already like God. They were already made in his image. So why, why in the world would he try to convince them of something that they already knew? See, this, this is what fear does. Fear tries to pull you away from the nature of God and who he is, that he's given us power and love and of a sound mind. Fear is a spirit that wants to destroy your life. And he'll do it right through anxiety to keep you away from people, out of community, away from God. Isolate yourself. That's why I wrote, that's why I titled this Panic Room is because, you know, Panic Room is meant to be a place of safety in the midst of terror. But when it comes to anxiety and panic and depression, we isolate ourselves and pull ourselves away from the very people and the person, Jesus, who can really help us. Because we think, we, 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 if, if I can just pull away, then I'll be okay. No, that's not true at all. You need to be in community. You need to be around people. So he gives us three things. He gives us power, love, and a sound mind. Now, you know that you're operating in a spirit of fear if one of those is missing in your life. So I know that I'm succumbing to fear if I lack confidence, no power. I know I'm succumbing to fear when love is not present in my life, when I feel unloved, 
when I go through a position of indifference. I know that I'm experiencing the spirit of fear when there's confusion in my life, lack of clarity. So I think it'd be good to understand power, love, and a sound mind. So the first thing is God gives you power. Everybody say power. Fear makes you feel powerless. Fear will rob you of the possibilities of God because with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. But with fear, nothing seems possible. Fear denies. It rejects the possibilities of God. So he gives us an antidote to overcome that fear. And guess what? It's on the inside of every one of you. When you became a Christian, there was a deposit that was made in you. Power. You know, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, translated into English. The New Testament was written in Greek, translated into English. There are two words in the New Testament that are translated into power or authority. And I think there are two levels of power that we all walk in as Christians. So if you're a born-again believer, bought by the blood of the Lamb, you have these two levels of power operating in your life to deal with anything that the enemy presents to you, specifically fear. Two levels. The first we find in Luke chapter 10. Jesus says, behold, I give you authority. This is the Greek word exousia, exousia, to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. All in the Greek is all. It means everything. There's nothing, pull, you, there's nothing absent from that. Everything. Anything the enemy presents to you, you have exousia. You have authority over. And nothing will by any means hurt you. This is what's, what I call positional power. You sit in a position of power because of your submission to Jesus. Because that's where, that's where you get authority. Authority comes from being under authority. So the reason your authority exists is because you said, I, I believe Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. And because he is the creator of the universe, you sit in a position right under him. You know, the Bible says we sit in heavenly places. Like we're with Jesus. So you have that authority. But not only that, positionally do you carry authority or power, but you also have what I call transactional power. Acts chapter one, verse eight, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The word power translated into the Greek is the Greek word dunamis, where we get dynamite from. Now let me give you a good example of this, just to kind of give you an illustration. As my friend says, let me build a bridge, okay? Anybody ever been ever, ever, driving down the road and a cop pulls behind you? Do you get nervous? Absolutely. I know Bobby does. Well, I get really nervous, you know. Pastor Matt's, you know, shoving beer cans underneath his seat <laughs> to hide stuff. He's telling the kids, Shh, be quiet. Me, I start repenting. Then the lights go on. Uh-oh. You start looking, you look at, first thing you look at, speedometer, right? Then seatbelt. And then you're telling the kids again, just duck down, <laughs> you know, be quiet, don't say anything. You pull over to the side of the road, and then he walks up to your car, and, and you listen to what he says. And the reason you listen to him is because he's got this badge right here. Now, in Charlotte, I don't know what it says in St. Augustine, but in Charlotte, it says CMPD, and then it has their badge number. Now, you listen, if he tells you to put your hands up, you put your hands up. If he tells you to stop, you stop. If he tells you to get out of the car, you get out of the car. If he tells you to stay in the car, you stay in the car. You do everything. I love our police. I'm thankful for law enforcement. Aren't you? Aren't you thankful for law enforcement? Now, people say, I can outrun the cop car. Sure you can. But you can't outrun their radio. Because they can call friends that have badge. They have authority. They wear that badge because they are under authority. The whole state or the whole city supports them, right? Now, should you choose not to listen to that badge, they carry on the side some dunamis. <laughs> Power. This is exactly like you. Because of your Christianity, because of who you are in Christ, You've been given exousia. And should the devil not listen to your positional power, 
you have the ability to transact because of the dunamis that resides on the inside of you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives on the inside of you. So you can tell fear it's got to go, and it has to listen to you. That's that when you struggle with anxiety, the second thing he gives us is love. God loves me. When I think of love, the first verse I think about is 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. Why? Because perfect love casts out all fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect. They haven't been made perfect in love. Now, where does that perfect love come from? The word perfect means fully developed, uh, full-grown, mature. Only God can give that kind of love. I know my wife loves me. Oh, I know she, she's the best cook in the world. She takes care of me. You know, she birthed our three kids. I mean, just she loves me, but she doesn't love me like God loves me. People say all the time, you know, you can have unconditional love for your spouse or for somebody. I don't think we can fully operate in unconditional love. Only God can. Only God has the ability to really overlook your flaws. And this is what I struggled with. Let me tell you, when I started having panic attacks, I immediately went to what is wrong with you, Troy? There's something wrong with you. Here I am pastoring this church, supposed to be, you know, Mr. Pastor, Mr. Leader, preach every weekend, lead this great team, grow this church, and everything on the outside was looking great. But on the inside, I was a mess. I think, I think there was a part of me that had exited God's love. Because listen, listen, when you know God loves you, when you, when you really believe, the more you know God loves you, the less things around you will affect you. Let me say that one more time, because some of you need to hear this, that God loves you in spite of you. God loves you in spite of the mistakes you made yesterday, last week, last year, last month. Matter of fact, you've repented of them enough, and they're, they're gone. They're neither, he doesn't remember them at all. They're gone, and he loves you so much. But we question. Fear causes you to question, well, if God loved me, then why did I lose my job? If God loved me, then why did she leave me? If God loved me, then why, why are my kids acting this way? If God loved me, then why am I being overlooked? That internal pressure that we feel. Secondly, I think fear makes you selfish. So there's the love we receive, and then there's the love that we give. Because fear will cause you to go so inward. When I studied this, I found um, a psychiatrist by the name of Carl Menninger. He, was a, he, was, he led in the field of psychiatry around depression and mental illness and panic and anxiety. He really started this process for us to understand how it affects us um, psych psych psychologically, psychologically. And they asked him the question, what would you tell an individual who was so depressed, so anxious, that they wanted to commit suicide? What would you tell them? And they thought that he would answer, get into good counseling. You need to find a good counselor. I mean, he's a psychiatrist. Get on some medication. That's not what he said. Here's what he said. He said, you need to get up. You need to get out of bed. You need to get out of the house and go find someone who's in trouble and go help them. In other words, the quickest way to help yourself is to help someone else. The quickest way to overcome depression is to help someone get out of their depression. Man, it, it, is, it is healing. Why? Because the best way to find meaning in your life is to help someone find meaning in theirs. Listen, you know, if you're not serving here at Colonial Church, you need to. There's somebody that's waiting on the other side of your obedience really is i know i know i know you, you right now you you can't even imagine actually serving someone else because of the pain that you're going through but i promise you that pain will go away real quick if you help somebody get out of theirs somebody needs your story in your small group because i know you're anxious about sharing it what how are they going to judge me who cares like, who, who gives a rip? Somebody needs you here in this church. Get involved. Get connected. Go help somebody find their purpose in life. Because when you do that, 
your purpose is discovered. And anxiety will just lift off of you. Fear will lift off of you. Depression will just lift off of you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Clarity. Clarity. He gives us clarity. Fear will always be disguised as rational thought. There'll always be a reason to fear. The stock market, coronavirus, COVID-26, whatever. (laughs) There's always going to be a reason to fear. So faith has to precede your reason. In other words, my conviction has to be way stronger than what I feel, see, or hear. My conviction. Because what you see, feel, and hear will betray you. Your emotions are terrible leaders. Horrible leaders. We all have them. I have them. I had some this morning. You know, I mean, we all have emotions. My wife tells me I need to get more in touch with my emotions. <laughs> Feelings. Oh, I hate them. But we all have them. But they're terrible leaders. Now, faith, the word of God, truth is what should lead us in spite of what we feel, in spite of what we're going through. And I had to learn this, man. I mean, it was hard. It was really hard. So, you know, how did I conquer fear practically? The prayers that I pray. I had to change the way that I prayed with the promises that I learned. In other words, I had to dig into the Word of God and discover the promises, like this promise. Because here's what's interesting about the Word of God. Once you see something, you'll never unsee it. Hopefully, you'll never read this verse again. You'll look at it in a whole different way. Maybe you don't need it, but somebody you know does. And so I want to pray for you today. If you could just stand up on your feet real quick. Maybe just close your eyes for a second all across this room. If you're here today and and maybe you're struggling with anxiety, you're struggling with panic, depression. (coughs) Statistics tell us that people struggle with it for 11 years before they actually admit it. 11 years. I don't know where you're on this journey. Maybe it's brand new or maybe it's been 11 years. But I'm telling you, if you'll allow God access right now, he will heal it. If, if If you will give him your fears, he will unveil your faith. He'll do it. He'll do it right now. If that's you, if you say, Pastor Troy, I, 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 I'm dealing with anxiety. Troy, I'm dealing with panic. Troy, I'm dealing with depression. I don't know what to do next. Look, we want to help you. Colonial Church wants to help you. We want to help you. We want to come alongside you. But right now, let's start the process and let the presence and the power of God begin some healing in your heart, your mind. If that's you, just raise your hand right where you are. I I need help with anxiety. I need help with panic. I've been having panic attacks. I didn't even know what they were until somebody had to explain them to me. I'm going through depression right now. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. It's dark. Just raise your hand. Take that same hand. Just put it right on your heart right now. I'm going to pray for you. Father, I pray for every person. God, I thank you so much for their honesty and confession today. Lord, you said if we draw near to you, you'll draw near to us. So, Father, we're just taking little baby steps, but we're coming near. We're coming close, and we, we expect and desire the presence of God to come and remove every bit of fear. The fear of being found out. <laughs> the fear of, of taking the step. The fear of serving. The fear of what, what's going to happen next. The fear of worry. I take authority over that. In Jesus' name, I break its power over their life right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, I thank you for freedom. I thank you for freedom. I thank you for freedom right now. God, they'll walk out of this room different, changed. The process has begun today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you're here today, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, we sing about him today. If you don't know him as your personal Lord and Savior, maybe you stumbled into church today, somebody invited you, promised you a cup of coffee afterwards. I'm so glad you're here. The best decision you could ever make in your entire life is to say yes to Jesus Christ. 
Yes, you're going to get into heaven. That's a future event, for sure. It's fire insurance, yes. But also, there's a lot of heaven that he wants to live, you to live right now. There's a lot of heaven he wants to, you can experience. Does that mean you're not going to go through problems? Oh, gosh, you're going to go through some problems. But you have a Savior who cares for you and loves you. Maybe you're here today and, and, and you say, you know, I once followed God. Can I just tell you something? I'm so proud for you proud of you for stepping back into church. One of the hardest things in the world is to come back. It's so hard. I think about that kid in the Bible who, who ran away from his dad. I can't imagine every step he took coming back to the father, the thoughts that were running through his. What, would I be accepted? Would I be judged? What's going to happen next? Let me tell you, you're in a house right now. You're in a place right now that will not judge you, that will tell you the truth, love you back into the grace of and the mercy of Jesus Christ. He loves you so much, and he has a plan for your life. If you say, I wanna give Jesus my life for the first time or for the 101st time, I'm gonna pray for you. I'm gonna count to three. If you say that's me, just raise your hand real quick. I just wanna know who I'm praying for. Ready, one, two, three. Just raise your hand all across this room. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Just keep it up for a second so I can, hands all over the room, thank you. Let's pray this out. Church family, could you make this confession all together? Let's say this all together. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that his blood washes me of all my sins and all my mistakes. Today I give you my life. I will worship you and I will serve you forever and ever. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, give God a big hand clap.